What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle Podcast. I'm Scott Bayer here, as always, with Tori McElhaney and Chris Rim. And we just got done talking about how I wanted to come up with a new introductory phrase <laughs> and how I couldn't think of it. My brain is so hardwired to saying it, exactly that. Chris Rim gave the stamp of approval. That means everything to me. So I was able to go <laughs> along with what we've always done. Uh, I, I, I wish that wait I, I'm mad that my stamp of approval is not on on the list you haven't even said that you want my stamp of approval and now I'm feeling left out <laughs> but I'm he's sad so cool. Scott <laughs> I know Chris is honestly between the three of us Chris is definitely like if we're going on like a cool meter which me even saying the word cool, cool meter, meter <laughs> means that oh. I'm not even on the meter um so I think <laughs> You know what? It's fine. Chris is the cool one. I accept it. Everybody's got our thing, you know? Everybody's cool in their own way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Chris. (laughs) And we have such a cool topic today. Fun transition. Great transition right there. Cue for forced laughter. Uh, Nonetheless, uh, we are going to talk Falcons football today. I swear it. Um, And we're going to dive into our question of the week, which is which pertains to the future or Falcons future of one Cordero Patterson, somebody who's made no bones about it. He'd like to return to Atlanta for a second year. That's very clear. It's not necessarily a guarantee. And we're going to break down the pros and cons and pluses and minuses and eventually drop a bold prediction on everybody about whether they're going to be able to retain someone that pro football focus recently designated as the best offensive signing of last offseason, the best wow. in the entire league. In terms of value, it doesn't get much better. It was a one-year deal for $3 million, Yep. right? Yep. Three, $3 million. He definitely exceeded that, that pay rate and what. And I, I, I think I, I named him the most valuable player for the Falcons because he did so much. The guy even played Hail Mary safety um, <laughs> and was a kickoff returner for a while, a running back receiver, all that type of thing. Um, There's no questioning his value, but now as we kind of turn the page here and look forward, um, I guess I'm just curious, uh, Chris, I guess we'll start with you. Um, In terms of re-signing him, uh, what are your kind of thoughts on that? If you want to play GM, you know, um, how you evaluate Patterson and maybe what type of value that you place on him if you want him back. Yeah, well, well, I think, with with CP, I think his it's interesting because his numbers diminished at the end of the season. And I think that was partly I don't know if it was really because if you could say like, oh, teams would figure him out or, or something like that. Um, but for one, the running lanes weren't there where they seemed to be earlier in the year. And two, it seemed like he wasn't used as, re- as a receiver as much as he was through the first 12 or 13 games that he was in. So that seemed to also play a role in the numbers he had at the end of the season. But I think the biggest question for me when you think about bringing CP back is do you, does Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith believe that he, that this year wasn't a one-year wonder? Do they think that he can recreate this year? If they feel that he can, he'll be 31 in March. If they think that he can do that, then maybe you find a way to work that out. Again, there are plenty of needs elsewhere um, and I'm sure you could definitely feel the production he had. You know, you talk about Calvin being back, other guys potentially coming back. You could feel that receiving production and you could likely feel that rushing production as well. So I think the biggest question is for them. I'm kind of turning your question into a question. But for mm-hmm. those two, do you think that he can replicate that? And if you do, then maybe you try to make it work out um, in a team friendly way. Yeah, Tori, what do you think about what Chris is bringing up here? I mean, it's lots of valid questions. No, I think they're all the right questions. And I I think that it's really complicated because I feel like, you know, a guy like CP in the year he has, it should be rewarded. But at the exact same time and in the exact same breath, you do wonder, is was this just a one hit wonder like what Chris is saying? Or is this something that can be expounded upon in a couple more years? I mean, I, I think that's where you're at. Like the Falcons as an organization are at this really interesting I think crossroads where they're not exactly uh where they're not where they want to be they're still in the early stages of trying to get the foundation set for where I think Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot want to uh, want to go and 
just I, I, I say this a lot and just kind of looking at the cap and I, I think that really and truly when you're looking at the cap, I think that there's a lot to be said about what the Falcons will be able to do in 2023 that they're not yet able to do in 2022. I think if this is a 2023 conversation where we're talking about CP, then I think it's a little different of a conversation. You maybe do have more of an ability to re-sign him. But in 2022, the Falcons are still strapped for cash. Things aren't easy by any means in regards to the salary cap. And and they're really going to have to be very strategic about the money that they're giving to some of these guys. And and even though CP had the year that he did, and I think it should be rewarded, I just don't know if the Falcons have the means to give him what he would be asking for, which is a pretty significant number if you're going off of what his market value projections are. Yeah, and and, and we're going to dive into uh, all of these questions, including uh, whether they would go, whether the uh, Falcons would go for some of these um, for some of these uh, projected salary numbers. Um, we're going to talk about Terry Fontenot's statement about the best form of free agency is rewarding your own players. We're going to talk about uh, Cordero's social media campaign, which is very interesting. Uh, he called Terry Fontenot scary Terry, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At one point, and uh, what do you think, or what what we think is required uh, to get Patterson back in red and black uh, next year? But before we do all that. A big thank you to our sponsor, Microsoft Windows 11, the official operating system of the NFL and the Atlanta Falcons. The all new Windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love, including Falcons Final Whistle podcasts. Learn all about the awesome new features of Windows 11 at windows.com. So since we're diving right into this thing, uh, we'll get to the social media stuff in a little bit. Let's go into, let's kind of combine uh, the, the, these first to- these first couple topics. And you can also guys read about our question of the week on atlantafalcons.com. We have a full round table where, where we go over a number of things that uh, Tori McElhaney brings up. She is the question, the, the queen of the questions. I, I don't know. Yeah. Something. Okay. <laughs> Let me fix my crown real quick. Yeah, Maybe I yeah. should start wearing a crown while we record these. And, yeah. and I'm just the queen of the questions. Eventually we're going to have to go to video here. I mean, that would involve. I agree. I completely agree. I think people would love to watch us just stare at each other and laugh. Like I think, (laughs) I think people would like that. (laughs) Yeah. Laughing till I'm literally crying. Um, (laughs) uh, Yeah. And especially if there's any more dating app updates, those are always good. Dear God, I hope not. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay. But uh, nonetheless, Terry Fontenot has has talked about the best form of free agency, re-signing your own players. Um, with, with that in mind, and I'm just reading Tori's question now, uh, where do you, <laughs> uh, where do you prioritize Patterson in regards to the other free agents? The other free agents are younger, Russell Gage, Foyer, Lewican. There's a number of guys who are in on one year deals. I mean, um, and so what do you, where do you prioritize Cordero in that group with some of the bigger guys, Hayden Hurst and uh, guys like that? You go ahead, Chris. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say. I think he. I think we both. We, wait. We both started breathing and talking at the same time. I was like, mm, "You're gonna go." <laughs> yeah, I was just like, I don't know what's going. <laughs> but I think I would say he's right up there near the top. I would. I would probably say that Foyer would be the biggest priority if I was deciding who to sign, just because of his age, and and because I think Foyer has a lot of room to grow. Like I think he was just scratching the surface of of where he could be this season. I think. You know the the tech people say about the tackles numbers what it really means if it's if it means that you're you had a good season or if it means that your you know defensive line wasn't really playing well but regardless still a lot of tackles um and i think he had had a good year but with cp yeah i think he's right up there around the same level i think with with gage with his production and what he done what he did he was the team's second either the first or second most you know dynamic offensive weapon with kyle he was probably the most consistent up until the end of the season. So I'll put him right behind Foyer on this. I, I was maybe say on this around the same as Gage, I guess Gage is younger too. So maybe, maybe right behind Gage. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's kind of where I put him too. And cause I, I personally think Foyer is the number one free agent for the Falcons that you're looking to resign this off season. And I'm not going to talk about Foyer because I feel like I talk about Foyer 24 seven 
I write about him all the time. I apparently talk about him all the time too. So I'm just like, not, we're not going to go there yet because we're probably going to do a whole nother podcast just about Boye. But what I will say is that with, with CP, I, I do kind of put him in the same category as I, I put Russell Gage. Like, sure, it'd be great to have them back, but you know that there are going to be other offensive skill players elsewhere. Whether we're talking about the draft, whether we're talking about free agency, there are going to be guys out there who can produce at the same clip that these guys have in 2021. And honestly, you're looking for more production as you move forward into 2022 and 2023, obviously, because you, if you're the Falcons, you're hoping this thing is growing. Uh, so, so I think like with that in mind, if you're look, if I'm looking at the top three free agents this off season, from the Falcons being Foye, CP, and Russ, I think it's obviously Foye number one, and then two, three can be interchangeable between CP and Russ. And, and I say that because I think it's more difficult to replace Foye at that Mike linebacker position than it is to replace the production of CP and Russell Gage when you have a full complement of offensive skill players, which I think I don't want to say are interchangeable, but to a certain degree, I felt I, I do feel like you can get that production in multiple spots. And, and especially if this offense can improve from 2021 to 2022. So that's kind of just where my mind's at. Yeah, they were so reliant on Patterson at times during the year. It was like if he didn't do a, her a heroic thing, the offense was going to sputter. I don't want to be that if I, if I'm the Falcons, I don't want to be that reliant on that player, but you can see his value. If things aren't going right at other spots, he can just do a lot of interesting things that, um, that I think would be advantageous. And for as much as Patterson enjoyed being here, the Falcons enjoyed having him here. I, that seemed yeah. very clear to me that Arthur Smith really liked him. I do think that, we talk about prioritizing the the free agents, right? And if you put Foye at one, and that seems to be our consensus, it's about what it's going to take to get that deal done, right? Because you're talking about a finite and a relatively small amount of money that you can play with, even if you create more cap space. So if it takes maybe your arm to be twisted a little bit to get Foye and it's a little uncomfortable, then you have less of a pool for the others, right? So yep. that, in my opinion, you need to get Foye done before free agency even hits just get it done so you understand the playing field of where you're at with the guy that you really want to keep i don't know if foyer is going to go along with that but nonetheless um since, since patterson is in that second tier i think it's important but when you look at this spot track number right two years 18 million dollars yeah uh, that's tough that is it. that that's the falcons aren't going to be able to play with that they just yeah. aren't like point blank are not going to I don't know if they should be able to play with that. And this is no knock on Patterson who have covered it at two different teams. He's a, he's an elite athlete who has oh, yeah. done some really interesting things, but as Chris brought up, he's going to be 31 next year. Right. And is it flash in the pan? The fact that we are wondering that we're not the only people wondering that. Right. right? Yeah. And, and, and I think that, that that kind of plays into it about what kind of, what kind of offer, what kind of value suits him? Like I, I, I talked about wanting to get Foyer done before he, he hits the open market. Maybe some teams go nuts for him, right? I, I think maybe you want to let Cordero kind of see the market and hope the market is depressed in some way for him and then they can get him at a good value. Um, well, that's a lot. Was, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just going to say too, I think when you look at that evaluation, I, I don't think anyone's going – to that number, to be yeah. completely honest. I don't think yeah. any, anyone's paying that number. And I think he knows that. And that's why he's campaigning the way he is, because perhaps if he does hit the, if he does hit the open market, then he might get even less than what maybe the Falcons offer him before he gets out there before free agency officially starts and, and teams offer him. So I think, I think he's aware that, like I, I said before, I think to make the, I think even to make the money work with TP, there will be tough decisions, you know, with his best friend on the team uh, with Mike Davis. Yeah. Cause I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a future where they both are back in, in the backfield. 
um, because that that would free up money to to give to him. And I think my, my thought too is if if the Falcons were to bring him back, I, I would think it would be a heavily incentivized deal with the front half the first year guaranteed. And and I, I could see something like that working out where you know you would essentially have to outperform what you did this year to earn you know six million dollars or, or or whatever amount of money it is. Yeah, and I, I I think that's a good way to structure it. It sounds like it's, I mean, it's not going to be another one-year deal, I would assume, but you're right. If you put all the guarantees up, up front and you can find a way to make that work. And to your point, um, that, well, I guess in addition to your point, that we talk about the wide receiver core, the only guys under contract are Calvin Ridley and Frank Darby. The only guy under contract in the running back room is Mike Davis. And there's no guarantee that he could be around that the, the Falcons could be looking at a clean slate. I do think it's an either or situation, right? If you can get Cordero, then, then you can let Mike go, maybe draft a younger runner, no matter what happens with, with Patterson, the Falcons still need a workhorse, right? They, yeah. they still need a guy that can produce and younger is always better at that um, position. So I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this thing shakes out. I mean, do you agree, Tori? that it's going to have to be like a, I mean, two years, one year at a, at a super high rate. Like, I don't know what Patterson might take, how much leverage yeah. that he has at, at this yeah. point. I mean, that, that all of those questions are questions that I think like the CP's agent, CP, the Falcons are all kind of weighing as we kind of head into free agency in the next, what is it next month? I, I mean, I, I just kind of think about it and I'm just like, in order for the Falcons to, to sign CP, CP is going to have to be willing to play ball a little bit. Like, he, you know, he's saying that he wants to stay in Atlanta and Atlanta, he's wearing sweatshirts that say Atlanta, Georgia changed my life. And, you know, and he's saying he wants to stay in Atlanta. It's like, okay. Like if, if you want to stay in Atlanta, the way that you stay in Atlanta is to work with the Falcons because they don't have the money to pay you everything that you're probably going to be asking for. So if, if you really feel strongly about staying in Atlanta and potentially retiring in Atlanta sometime in the next year or two years, you got to essentially work with the organization in order to do that. If you're just in it for the paycheck and the money, which if that's, if that's all it is, then that's all it is. And that's great. Go get your paycheck, my guy. Like no one's going to be mad or upset about that. But if it's also this like, sentimental feeling of wanting to be in Atlanta and, and to stick with this coaching staff that essentially helped you kind of like crack a code that in the 10 years that you've been in this league, it hasn't happened yet. I mean, I think that's all something you have to weigh. And we also have to think about it this way that like, this is very much going to be a negotiation process. I have no doubt that this is going to be a solid negotiation from CP's camp to the Falcons side of things and it's going to be a lot of talks back and forth of trying to figure out where this deal could be made and I think there is a possibility that a deal could be made but it really will depend on how much CP is willing to play around and play ball with the Falcons organization in this yeah, and so in that they always say did not negotiate through the media right um oh no. yeah <laughs> Well, Cordero's not really negotiating necessarily, but he's talking a lot about wanting to stay in Atlanta, posting a lot of, if you guys follow his, uh, his Twitter, especially, you know, seeing pictures of him hugging Arthur Blank and cut the check Arthur and, you know, uh, a photo of him and quote unquote, scary Terry and um, <laughs> All those he even posted things. an update of uh, his locker and was like, locker's still here, like with the emoji, the sunglass emojis or something like that. Like, so this is someone who's actively campaigning to stay with the Falcons, which I find incredibly interesting because I don't think many people do that during free agency. Yeah, and it's pretty it's pretty cool, too, because it, I think it puts the front office in a, a kind of a, a tricky situation. Not really. I mean, if, if they care that much about, you know, the fan base. But if you what he said in November when I talked to him was like he already had this on his mind. Like I try to win your fans over. So when it's contract time, they're also rooting for me too. And that's literally happening right now. So 
if they aren't able to come to a deal and then fans say, well, this guy really wanted to be here. He was campaigning. How many guys do we have who do that? And you won't even resign him like that. <laughs> that oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Something like that when it couldn't even have been that way. It could be he's, he's behind the scenes saying something completely different. I need this much money. But on the outside, it looks like he wants to be here for whatever. And y'all couldn't make it work. So it is an interesting tactic. I guess it has pros and cons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Chris. Ray has a hand he- raised. I have my hand raised. We need video so bad. <laughs> I know we really do. I'm yeah. legit like raising my hand it's, it's in the camera shot. Uh, Chris, didn't you ask Terry if he had seen CP's yeah. Twitter? Yeah. What he did just, he say? He just started laughing the whole time. <laughs> he said, I didn't, he just said, I don't notice it. But he was kind of looking at me like. <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone has absolutely, someone has absolutely <laughs> screenshot and sent it to scary Terry and be like, scary Terry, what's this about? Yeah, there's no, there's no way. Yeah, <laughs> he said I don't notice it, man. But you know, it was it was one of them. I think he notices it. <laughs> He's a funny guy. <laughs> funny guy, that scary Terry. <laughs> I wonder if Arthur Blank is seeing it. That's what. That's what. Oh, mean. that's a better. That's even a. That's a better question. He called him pops. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's his profile pic now, right? It is. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's it's a nice it's... shot of them all. Them giving a last little hug. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 definitely an interesting strategy, uh, or um, and I think it does work because the fans they want players who want to represent their town and their colors and their logo, right? Um, and Patterson is a guy that clearly wants to do that. At the same time, you know, who who knows if he hits the open market, right? I, I'm going to rewind, start over. <laughs> thing, right? This is. A, this is an opportunity, maybe the last one to cash in, right? And I don't know what cash in means. It doesn't mean cash in like, you know, like like a true tier A free agent, but this is an opportunity for him to go make some money and earn longer. He's been playing on one-year deals for a long time, essentially. So this is that shot. If I was in that position, just speaking for me, I'm going to go, yeah, I'm going to go get some, no doubt. I, and- it, we need video because i'm sitting here just like the money signs like <laughs> drop them dollars like go get your paycheck man yeah and and and, and kind of do what you got to do to get it now if if it can work out where atlanta you know offers that but you know i would really be trying to say hey man uh look at look 31 other teams this is what i can do if you know if i'm still on the open market by march let's let's uh let's fill up the uh, dance card so I, I think that that plays into it too even though i know how old am i i said dance i know card. it was so funny I, anybody now. watch bridgerton up in here <laughs> go fill out the dance card yeah, <laughs> i'm reading right. i'm currently reading a book it's called bringing down the duke, the duke and it's essentially like that time period she was talking in, the, in it's about uh oxford women's suffrage movement in 1879 yep i'm and just that old <laughs> yeah that's not bear 1879 1879 <laughs> oh my gosh this podcast has run off the rails a couple of times i did it the first time about 15 seconds in and then it just became an okay thing to do <laughs> you know, we need a, we need a quote graphic with that on there the, the, about the women's suffrage movement in, oh 100 with story on there in like black and white in like nice i'm, I'm stopping type font <laughs> or, or like we should just have a series of quotes tori mcelaney talking about re-signing or, or, or getting asked about football questions in dating apps and then the next yes. week talking about women's suffrage <laughs> In, at Oxford University in 1879. Ugh. Oh, God. Good time. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're getting aggregated by Oxford Magazine or something. Hey, <laughs> that's, that's fine. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, ch- uh, tapping into all new elements of search engine optimization. Okay. Uh, we're trying to get that. Uh, never mind. Oh, gosh. There are tears. Okay. In my okay. Eyes. <laughs> all right. Here, we're, we're, we're starting to wind down to the end of this thing here. Uh, let's try to put us back on, on course, maybe, just maybe. Uh, two, two final questions. Um, what do you think will need to happen for the Falcons to re sign him? And do you think that he's a Falcon next year? Ready, go. Uh, I think to re sign him, <laughs> to re sign him, like I said, I think Mike, they'll have to go. And it'll have to be a, a heavily incentivized deal. And then I think I said I think I said earlier when we were writing this, I said yes, I think the Falcons re-sign him. 
and I said that it'll be, I think partly I said that because, you know, Tori said no. So I was trying to, I think I've, <laughs> I think I've agreed with her in the past couple. So I was just like, let me, just, you know. but <laughs> my case for yes is that essentially what Tori was saying earlier, he keeps saying he wants to stay. He keeps saying he wants to be here. His family lives right down the road. He has young kids and, and a longtime girlfriend moving. This is 15 and six years. I'm sure moving is, is not, you know, not the easiest thing to do for all of them starting over so many times. So maybe he is really willing to, you know, retire here and ride off into the sunset, take a deal that's maybe not the most he could get, but a team friendly one. So that's my stance for yes. Oh, I'm going to drop the hammer and make everyone upset, including <laughs> maybe CP. CP, if you're listening to this, dude, mad respect uh, for, for, for all, all, the, all the things. Um, and this is not a knock on CP. I want CP to get paid. So I must preface my no by saying that. I, I don't think that Patterson will be a Falcon in 2022. And I say that because it's just like the whole idea of like follow the money. And I just don't know if the money is going to go to Patterson at this point in time and this, where this organization is. And, and I say that thinking about Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith looking for players that they can build upon in the future. Because if you think about it, there are a lot of old guard guys who, are not, who, who their contract is not going to be around in 2024. And so don't you want to start building something when all of these people are gone and, and to be completely honest, because of his age, CP is not going to be here in 2024. So why would you not start investing in the people who will be? And I think that in and of itself is kind of where I, my mind is when I, when it comes to, do I think if C, do I think CP will be a Falcon in 2022? And I think no, just because of, of those reason simply money wise would I love to see CP back in the Falcons uniform 100% I think CP has been really great for this Falcons organization and for the fan base but again to for me it's all about the money yeah and and I, I think that even though it's all about the money I think if he is not signed by Mar one, I think he will be back. And here's why I think the open market for a 31 year old running back who's new to the position and has a lot to learn. Um, I think that, I think that the market won't be as robust as maybe he would like. And I think the Falcons can offer him a deal that I think allows him to stick around here, allows him to thrive here. Maybe it, I really like this. Um, two-year deal concept, first year guaranteed. The second one gives the Falcons some options. Um, and I think that that's how they could structure it in a way that is a win-win um, and maybe in a type of scenario where you take what you were going to pay Mike Davis and then you combine it with what Patterson made last year and maybe you can work something around that. Um, so for that reason, I think that he's, I, I think he will be back. I think the deal will be pretty reasonable, even if he doubles his paycheck, um, over the course, you know, of 2022. Um, I feel like they, I, I just feel like eventually it will come together. It may, I don't think it's going to be quick though. I think it's gonna be something that there's, there's so many moving, so many dominoes have to fall before they get to that point. Um, and, but I do think eventually they end up, um, with a deal. So for all of those people, going to Tori McElhaney's in dating apps, asking the question, <laughs> which was brought up originally, in the first was, podcast. are they going to re-sign CP, right? Like that was the original yeah. question that you were getting. Well, you don't have to go to the dating app anymore. We've answered it. Tori's on the record. Yes. Tori's on the record. So if anybody ever asks again, you just I'm say just uh, timestamp 2355. Okay. Right. No, I'm going to just send them the link of the podcast and be like, don't ask me. Just listen to the podcast and give us a five-star rating and review. Thank you. <laughs> there you are. That's, Thank that's you. That was the key part the five-star review. Yeah, yeah. That, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, we generally kind of just meander towards an ending. I, I think that's a good way to punctuate it, right? I do too. I mean, it's a natural, it's a natural progression. You know, we, as storytellers, we love a full circle moment and we have this now come fun. full circle uh, with, <laughs> with the dating app story from the first episode to now here we are with answering the question, 
for the men in my DM. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs> and scene. That's and all. And scene. We're done. <laughs>